to Current Affairs. My name is Nathan Robinson. I am the editor-in-chief of Current Affairs magazine. I am joined today by Professor Johanna Fernandez. She is a historian of social movements at the City University of New York and the author of The Young Lords, A Radical History, available from UNC Press. Professor Fernandez, thank you so much for joining us on Current Affairs. And thank you so much for reading the book and for being willing to tackle this subject matter, which dominated the better part of my life, it feels. Yes. <laughs> and I left my little beating heart in it. That's evident when one opens the book. It is the sort of book that could only have been the product of many, many years of deep research and reporting in the archives through interviews. It is a rich history. Yay! Yes. <laughs> the subject matter is deserving of the kind of care that I think I gave it. Yeah. So the subject of the book is the Young Lords. You say in the book that the Young Lords are of interest not only because it's just a, a compelling story of a 1960s revolutionary social movement, but you say that today's organizers can take a great deal. You say the Young Lords offer a wealth of practical lessons for those of us today. I just want to quote you here. You say their intrepid organizing campaigns, literature, bold political analysis, and media savvy reclaimed the dignity of New York's hardest working and most exploited workers and replaced stereotypes with powerful images of radical, strategic, and articulate militancy. So there are a great many reasons why even those who are not interested in history purely for the sake of learning about the past, even if you want to understand the lessons of organizing in the past for organizing in the present, you should turn to the Young Lords a Radical History. Yes. So social movements change history, but the freedoms we enjoy in society today are the product of struggle by ordinary people. So something that we take for granted today is the patient Bill of Rights. Mm. It's something that we assume has always been a right of uh, human beings and Americans in particular. Few people know that the first known patient Bill of Rights was written by the Young Lords drafted in the course of a struggle at a hospital in the Bronx and it was drafted alongside of hospital workers, nurses, doctors, and people in the community, demanding that doctors properly, carefully, and patiently explain health problems to patients and that see patients as partners in our care. That it was a new concept in the 60s when the Young Lords were operating. And so part of what I do in the book is outline their brilliant strategies as a kind of primer for activism. So what did they do? They identified a problem, and they often did so by consulting the community. They organized a strategy around it meant to stop business as usual for example, the operation of a hospital, they engaged in an enormous amount of political education. So they wanted to know what are the root causes of this problem and how can we educate the public about it? And what would we best imagine as the solution and organize then a campaign and a series of demands around those solutions? It's striking you know, when you look at the original uh, Patient Bill of Rights that, that was drafted in uh, 1970 by the Young Lords and others, because uh, you listed them in your book, that you know you do see in there things that we now kind of take for granted, like to have access to your medical chart. But you also see 
unfinished work, like demand number 10, to receive free health care, something that we are still far away from. That's the demand that, especially in the aftermath of the biggest national crisis we've seen in 100 years, the COVID outbreak, is most urgent. Uh, Free health care for all. It's the thing that connects us all to our deepest humanity, right? The moment when we're sick and we are urgently in need of dignified care that's accessible, that won't put us in a hole financially. And uh, health care that is not falling apart, as unfortunately we saw during the COVID epidemic. So, yeah, that is unfinished business for sure. Yeah, you do get the sense going back to the agenda of the Young Lords that uh, in many ways we really ought to pick up where they left off. But I want to go back to the start. I think for our listeners and readers, it would be helpful if you could explain the origins of this group and perhaps even before that, explain the context in which this group originally arose, because the Young Lords comes, as as you note in the book, out of the mass migration of Puerto Ricans to the mainland United States. So perhaps we, we could start with some of the context out of which this group comes. So the Young Lords form part of a larger movement in the 1960s that we know as the New Left. And the New Left is essentially the movement composed mostly of young people, many college students, but many not, like the Young Lords, who accomplished three major things. The New Left radically changed the relationship between white people and people of color in the United States through the civil rights, black power, brown power movements. The New Left challenged the country's assumptions about issues of gender and sexuality through the women's movement, and it made it acceptable to question how the United States government conducts U.S. foreign policy. And so that was accomplished through the movement against the Vietnam War. A new generation of young people reared in the 1950s during the Cold War, alienated by these drills that were constant in public schools, a warning of the possibility of the dropping of atomic bomb in our soil, especially among white students, Mm -hmm. uh, folks who were reared in the suburbs for the first time in the history of the country. The suburbs were new. And folks who were people of color who were migrating to the cities in large numbers. So in the aftermath of World War II, there's a great migration of Black Americans to cities in the South and in the North, uh, Montgomery, Birmingham, but also Chicago, New York, Detroit, Philadelphia. You also have Puerto Ricans migrating in the post-World War II period out of the island to cities like New York, Chicago, and Philadelphia as a result of U.S. economic policy on the island by the name of Operation Bootstrap. It's an industrial project that displaces more farmers than it is able to absorb in the emerging industrial economy. And literally a third of the people of the island are displaced. And the program has a contingency plan, and that's migration. So a third of the people of the island are displaced to to cities like New York, Chicago, and Philadelphia. During this period, Chicanos or Mexican-Americans are also leaving rural areas to cities like Los Angeles, Austin, Dallas, and beyond. And Mexicans are coming from Mexico. Native Americans are also becoming urbanized during this period. 
So for people of color, this was the big moment of their urbanization. And it is that movement of people of color from rural areas to cities that transforms their power politically and economically. They become part of the working class for the first time. And they get a sense of their power in numbers in the cities. So it's, for example, the urbanization and proletarianization of Black Americans that makes them less vulnerable to the terror of the Klan in the South and makes possible the launch of a civil rights movement that has the possibility of winning. Previous to this moment, Uh, Black people fighting Jim Crow were up against a high incline. The KKK was more powerful than they were because they were atomized and isolated in rural areas. But it's the urbanization of people of color that makes possible the rise of the civil rights and Black power movements. And that's something that's happening in the South and in the North. So that's the context for the emergence of an organization like the Young Lords, which very important to your listening audience, is the Puerto Rican counterpart of the Black Panther Party. Yeah. I think one of the things that's fascinating about the origins of the Young Lords, as you retell it, is that it doesn't originally arise in the form that it ultimately takes, in that it begins as a street gang, right? (laughs) And you know what? That is one of the most fascinating elements of this history, and it's uh, the subject of the first chapter of my book. So gangs were a fixture, if you will, of life in urban centers like Chicago, New York, Detroit, Philadelphia. The pre-existing gang formations were built by white working class youth, ethnic whites. And they had been around for at least 200 years in cities like New York and Chicago. When people of color begin to migrate to the cities in the North en masse, young people are forced to replicate these pre-existing formations for self-defense, literally because they are not welcomed, unfortunately, by their white ethnic neighbors. And they're literally driven out of parks and pools and playgrounds. And, you know, the scuffle between white kids and Black and Latino kids is the form that racism takes in the playground and in the streets. Mm. So the Young Lords is one of these many gang formations led by uh, Puerto Ricans and Mexicans that emerges in Chicago. But it is transformed by its leader, who's imprisoned in the late 50s and early 60s. He's politicized in prison because he starts reading Martin Luther King's book, Where Do We Go From Here?, but also the autobiography of Malcolm X. Even the biography of Thomas Merton, a Catholic monk, a seven-story mountain, and he decides that he is going to transform his gang when he leaves prison into a political organization. Mm. You know, you document that in the early 1960s, in the first years of the Young Lords, you know, most of the gang's activities are things like, you know, stealing cars and getting in rumbles. But even then, even in this phase, there's there's this fascinating thing you mentioned, which is the way that even as a, a street gang, you say, I'll just quote, The Young Lords ran roughshod through de facto white spaces and over the course of many rumbles succeeded in opening up spaces that their parents had been afraid to enter. They didn't consider themselves to be civil rights activists, certainly, but almost had that effect through establishing strength in numbers and going to places where they uh, wouldn't have been able to go if they hadn't been so so tough and menacing. (laughs) 
I know. That was one of the most amazing findings. Yeah. Essentially, they went to the beach in Chicago. So I remember interviewing Chacha Jimenez, that was the leader of the gang, the Young Lords. And he said, you know what? Because of segregation, de facto segregation, of course, in urban centers like Chicago, we had to go around the world to get to the beach because we couldn't go to the beach that was just, you know, a mile away from us because it was segregated. And one day we decided, you know what? You want to go to the beach? Yeah, I want to go to the beach. Do you want to travel two hours to get a beach? No. Well, let's go. And they literally got into a rumble with the local white gang at the beach. And after that, Puerto Ricans and Black Americans waltz into the beach that had been segregated as if it never had been. And that happened with playgrounds and other urban spaces. So the civil rights movement that we think of as something that was orchestrated from on high by Uh, leaders like Martin Luther King and Mm. organizations like the Southern Christian Leadership Conference that he led was a product of that for sure, but it was also a product of the migration and urbanization of people in mass numbers and their aspirations to live better lives in a free America. Mm. You mentioned the politicization of Chacha Jimenez. And one of the most fascinating things is how he manages to start turning what had been a a gang mostly interested in hanging out with women and driving cars and getting into fights (laughs) into a radical political organization. Can you talk for, you know, the transitional moment for this group, how it turns into such a different organization in the course of a couple of years? Well, there's the personal story of Jose Chacha Jimenez. He's my favorite young lord till this day. He's got such a big heart, so humble, and just a real authentic human being. I'll tell you one story that really touched me deeply. So his mother was a Catholic, and she was part of the administration of the local Catholic church. She might've been the secretary and she somehow got uh, Chacha Jimenez a scholarship to attend Catholic high school. It was junior high school. And he tells the story of how parents in the school had traditionally organized a kind of celebration slash party slash prom independently of the school. And he didn't know that until he bumped into one of his friends who referenced the party to which he was not invited because his family was Puerto Rican. And the party was organized by mostly Irish and Italian parents. And he said to me, I was devastated This was the ultimate sign of rejection. This was my friend. How could he have not told me about this? How was I not invited? He said, this was the moment that I turned to the streets. I said, the hell with school, the hell with the adults. I'm going to find my people and my home in the streets. And he proceeded to get arrested that summer, he says, five or six times. Once you're in the cop's roster, you get picked up over and over and over again. And I was always in the streets. It was through one of these moments of imprisonment that he was asked by some migrants who had been in prison just in one of these, uh, what do you call them, when a bunch of people, usually migrants, are put in prison, there's a roundup. There's some kind of roundup by INS. Happened at the same time of the riots in Chicago in the aftermath of Martin Luther King's 
assassination. So Martin Luther King is assassinated. There are urban rebellions. Those people are rounded up and imprisoned or immigrants Mm. from Mexico rounded up and everyone's put in prison. The Mexican immigrants can't speak Spanish. They're being abused by the guards. And he's called to translate for one of them. And he says, I felt responsible. You know, these people reminded me of my parents. I knew that they were hardworking and they should not be in prison. And I felt like I needed to protect them. The least I could do was translate. He literally said, I was called by something higher than myself for the first time. And that really began his study of what was going on in the country, the civil rights and Black power movements. He started reading, as I said previously, Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, but also his mother had high hopes that he would become a priest. Hmm. So he had a profound sense of guilt about his petty crime, and he read Thomas Martin's Seven Story Mountain. When he left prison, he found that the neighborhood had changed dramatically and that Puerto Ricans had been driven out of their homes by urban renewal, which was that period's huge gentrification project, which was sponsored, unfortunately, by the U.S. federal government. And he was approached by a housing activist who encouraged him to bring together the members of his gang to stop the next round of displacements of Puerto Mm. Ricans from the outskirts of a white neighborhood. And he says, you know, I thought this crazy woman was a communist and I called her an effing communist B. And she persisted and I paid attention to her because I could see that the neighborhood had changed in the short time that I was in prison. And it seemed that my parents were next on the chopping block and they were going to be displaced. So he proceeded to talk to all of his guys in the gang one by one at the bar where they hung out, who also dismissed him and made fun of him for being all political now that you've been in prison. And he prevailed in the end after an enormous amount of persistence. But they landed at the office of urban renewal, where literally the plans for eviction of a new wave of working people was being discussed. And in gang form, they busted up the meeting and started throwing around chairs. So they weren't having a political conversation with the Office of Urban Renewal, but that began the process, which was arduous, of politicizing and educating these young people who were toughs. And then one of them was killed by the cops. And he says, really, that was the clincher. He wasn't there at the party where the young Lord was killed by a police officer. And the first person they called he said those who were arrested was Chacha because they knew that he was onto something and that this was such a miscarriage of justice and a you know tragic loss of their peer that they were going to have to mount a fight back. One of the most remarkable things about this transformation story in the early part of the young Laura's history is that you know, we kind of associate gang activity with you know, hopelessness, a, a feeling that you, you know, you can't very much on the margins of society, you can't participate in it or do anything to change it. And then, you know, this, not only this development of a political consciousness, but this development of, you know, anyone who becomes an organizer has to feel as if they have a certain power that they could change things. So how do they come to to feel that it is I don't know, worth being part of a political organization that they could, in fact, alter their circumstances. Well, that's really fascinating, and it has more to do with their phase as a gang. So the film West Side Story emerges and is launched in theaters right around this time that they become a gang. They're inspired, in fact, by West Side Story. 
And they say that for the first time, we're seeing the conflict between Puerto Ricans and white ethnic gangs on the big screen. And we're affirmed. So we take on the colors of the Puerto Rican gang in West Side Story. And for them, gang membership was an affirmation of their identity as Puerto Ricans, but also it was about a reclamation of their right to the city. Mm. So the gang and its members were engaged in petty criminal activity, but they were also engaged in community building activities like calling a party, organizing a party, designing the sweaters and the jackets, it happening and cool they were wearing and figuring out how to raise money to purchase them. So in many ways, the young lords in Chicago were successful in their other campaigns because they had established pretty wide and deep networks in the community that when mobilized showed up to the march against the killing of Manuel Ramos. And they also met the Black Panther, uh, Fred Hampton, who was the chairman of the Chicago chapter of the Black Panther Party, at a conference in, in fact, February 17th. I know because that was the same day that my book came out. (laughs) So they went to what was known as the Third World Students Conference in Chicago that was held on the weekend of February 17th, 1969. Fred Hampton was invited to speak and he wanted to meet the young lords about whom he had heard because Fred Hampton had already begun to try to organize white gangs the white patriots in particular, who were migrants from the South, from Appalachia, who landed in Chicago, very poor working class. And when Fred Hampton heard about the Young Lords, who were Puerto Ricans and Mexicans, he thought, wow, this is a real coalition that we can call the Rainbow Coalition. You probably know the Rainbow Coalition is a coalition called by the Black Panther Party of people at the bottom of society coming together across racial lines. So he called on uh, Black Americans in the Black Panther Party, Puerto Ricans and Mexicans in the Young Lords, and poor whites from Appalachia in the Young Patriots to come together to fight against poverty and for their common interests as working class and poor people. So that transformation that was political took really the Black Panthers, but also the intervention of that housing activist and many others who came together and transform the Young Lords from a gang into a political organization, but also into the university of kids who had dropped out of high school. It became a school where people read, debated, discussed on the root causes of social problems, the origins of racism in the United States, and a strategy for transforming society for the better. been talking so far about the Young Lords and their their origins in Chicago, but the organization spreads, and most of the campaigns that you focus on in granular detail in the book take place in New York City. So, and over quite a brief span of time, despite being pretty impressive. So, perhaps you could tell us a bit more about some of these this activism that takes place in the among the New York the Young Lords in the early 70s? So the Young Lords in Chicago make a big splash. They occupy a McCormick Theological Seminary. They figured, and this is something that Cha-Cha told me, we knew that white students were occupying buildings and making demands challenging the Vietnam War on college campuses. And 
I knew that if we were going to be relevant, we needed to deploy that strategy in our communities. So during one of the marches against the killing of one of their own, Manuel Ramos, a lot of people showed up and spontaneously they entered uh, McCormick Theological Seminary and occupied and put forth a series of demands against housing displacement experienced by Puerto Ricans especially, but also for better schools and affordable housing that was attractive, right? They didn't want the projects, for example, to be the model of housing that poor people uh, had access to. They demanded housing that would allow for the building of their communities. The Black Panther newspaper interviewed Chacha Jimenez and published that interview in their newspaper. And a bunch of kids in New York City, in East Harlem, read the interview in the January 7th issue of the Black Panther newspaper, the June 7th, 1969 issue. They read this interview with Chacha Jimenez and Chacha captured their imagination because they were trying to organize Puerto Rican youth in East Harlem. So they literally hopped in a car, drove all the way to Chicago, met Chacha and his compeers, and asked for permission to start a chapter of the organization in East Harlem. That summer, they started with an epic garbage dumping campaign. They asked the community you know, what's the big problem before you? They thought that the community was going to say police brutality, the segregation in our schools. And the community said, forget about all of that, the garbage. Look at the disaster on wheels that the sanitation leaves behind. They take half the garbage and leave the rest strewn. The kind of garbage that cities were producing was epic because this was the moment of the rise of consumer capitalism, right? The golden age of American capitalism in the 1950s is organized around consumption. And unfortunately, the sanitation systems in urban centers had not caught up with that level of production of garbage that we're so very well aware of today with all of our Amazon boxes that we don't know what to do with. So the young lords in New York started literally picking up the garbage and organizing it neatly for the sanitation department to pick up over the course of many, many uh, days and a number of weeks. The sanitation department didn't pick it up and they decided that they were going to throw the garbage into the streets, get the community involved. The community burned the garbage Traffic was stopped for 30 blocks on end in the middle of a major thoroughfare out of the city and to the suburbs. Immediately, they got coverage from the New York Times and other local press, and they became so popular and their numbers grew that they decided to literally rent an office in East Harlem and professionalize their operation. They did an enormous amount of work around lead poisoning. They went door to door alongside technicians and doctors to test children for lead poisoning. That children are poisoned from the chips of paint that fall off the wall and they put in their mouths. And they discovered that a third of the children they tested were lead positive. And as you know, lead is a neurotoxin mm. that leads to permanent brain damage. They occupied a church in East Harlem, inspired by the action of the young lords in Chicago. And finally, they occupied the hospital to dramatize the horrific conditions of health of the Black American and Puerto Rican communities in the South Bronx, but also the fact that the hospital was built in a different epoch and was falling apart and couldn't meet the needs of this ailing community. Yeah. We mentioned at the beginning that uh, you say that the Young Lords' successes offer a lot of practical lessons for organizers today. And we've just been talking about there, you know, taking the kind of quotidian, the everyday demands of the community on pretty mundane things 
like the garbage or you know things that really matter to people like you know we don't want our children poisoned by lead we want to have uh, people treated well in the hospital and decent hospitals taking their cues from the needs of the people they were there to serve uh, really helped make them quite successful and popular in a short amount of time. Absolutely. And I think you hit the nail on the head. Issues of quotidian life Mm. that everyone is concerned about. Is my neighborhood clean? Do I have access to a hospital that will save my child in an emergency? Lead poisoning disfigures the lives and learning possibilities of children. That's a problem that people cared about. And these issues had been debated and discussed in New York City and in other cities for some time, but no organization had mounted a political education campaign around it and a strategy to force the city to respond. So part of what the Young Lords did when they discovered that a third of the children they tested were lead positive was that they organized a series of press conferences, literally the media, exposing the city and its inactivity. They also occupied the office of the head of the health department of the city of New York and didn't leave until he offered a series of solutions to the problem. And in 1974, the Journal of Public Health, this is what I discovered over the course of many, many years of research, that journal credited the Young Lord's muckraking and militant activism in the streets for the emergence, for the first time in the history of the city, the Bureau of Lead Poisoning and anti-lead poisoning legislation that forced landlords to strip down the old lead paint from tenement buildings or be fined exorbitantly. So the actions of these young kids, I mean, the youngest young lord was age 13. The oldest in New York was maybe 24. The actions of these young kids influenced public policy in the city of Chicago and New York. And they also were active in Philadelphia, in Hartford, and beyond. You know, as one reads your book, the prevailing feeling, I think, is, you know, kind of excitement and inspiration, seeing, as you said, these perfectly ordinary young kids who are raised in very difficult conditions, just finding their power. Mm -hmm and organizing and getting together to accomplish real meaningful things for people. And they do, and they succeed. And it's incredible. But then you're reading about all of these really innovative actions that get results. The young lords come to an end rather quickly. And so if we're talking about, there are obviously a lot of practical lessons for how movements should operate if they want to extract concessions from those in power. But there's also certainly a lesson here as to what movements need to do to avoid dissolution and decline. So perhaps you could tell us, you know, why, after having so much success in in organizing, did the Young Lords fade away? Grassroots organizing and connection to communities is something that new generations of organizers and activists have to take seriously. The Young Lords were connected to their neighborhoods, to their families, to their communities, and they did the rounds. They held meetings in their buildings, in their churches, in their schools. They also sold their newspaper, Palante, which means Forward in Struggle, which, fascinatingly enough, they published on a regular basis, they published this newspaper and sold it in the community. So each young lord had a paper route, and they sought to engage people in the streets, in the bodegas, in the churches, on a regular basis. And it was through those meaningful conversations with people in the community about what they thought was wrong in a consistent 
way over time that got the community to take them seriously and to trust them. So trust is one of the building blocks of of organizing and activism. And in order for you to establish trust in the community, you have to be consistent, honest, determined. The Young Lords also had a political worldview. They had an analysis that identified the structural roots of social problems. They were self-proclaimed socialists who were inspired by the revolutions that were happening around the world against European colonial rule. And they also engaged in campaigns and developed well-thought-out strategies that were not always spontaneous. They thought it through. How can we get the city to respond? And they understood that they needed to use militant action. When they stopped consulting the mothers and the fathers and the old ladies and the grandpas, when they started disconnecting from the community, they made themselves vulnerable to attacks by the counterintelligence program of the FBI, known as COINTELPRO. But also their decline is connected to the broader decline of the movement. They emerge in the late 60s at the height of radicalization, right? When a significant minority of American society had, I would argue, a pretty sophisticated analysis of what was wrong with society. And this had been acquired over the course of almost two decades of struggle in the civil rights, black power, anti-war movements, the women's movement. So the movement was experiencing exhaustion by the early 70s. So that combination of things, the disconnection to the grassroots, the persecution of the organization by COINTELPRO, and the fact that the broader movement had reached its zenith and now it was on the decline, all of those things together led to uh, the, the decline of the organization. But I can't overstate the level of repression that all the movements confronted. Right. And maybe you want to speak on that. No, I think uh, important to bear in mind that, you know, we can look at all the mistakes of the 60s movement, but also <laughs> they're operating in conditions where they where the state was actively trying to destroy them. Exactly. And the state launched the homicidal campaign against the Black Panther Party, but also anti-war activists. Right. There's a film about how we found out about COINTELPRO through the actions of anti-war activists in media Pennsylvania who decided that they were going to break into the recruitment office, the local military recruitment office, because they wanted to burn the, um, what are those cards called? The um, Was this the draft cards? The draft cards. Yeah. Yes. I don't know if you've seen the film. I can't remember the name of it. It is brilliant. So these predominantly white kids also muckrakers, part of the anti-war movement, they bust into the military recruitment office in Media, Pennsylvania, in the outskirts of Philadelphia. They're looking for draft cards. They find all of these documents naming all of the organizations that they know well, both local and nationally. And they realize that this is some kind of sting operation against movement people that nobody knows about. It identifies those who are infiltrators employed by the FBI to infiltrate and destabilize these movements and create infighting within them. They know that they are going to be caught eventually. And so they put all of these papers into bags and suitcases and they reconvene in the middle of nowhere in the woods in Pennsylvania with a plan to send these documents 
to the New York Times, the Washington Post, but also they sent copies of all of these documents to the activist organizations and leaders named in them. And in these papers was printed over and over again the term COINTELPRO. And we later find out that COINTELPRO stands for the Counterintelligence Program of the FBI. That's how we know about this entity. And immediately, congressional hearings begin into the activities, illegal activities of this entity that violated the First Amendment rights of so many Americans in that period. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, it's easy to say, oh, well, look at these organizing failures, but then also Fred Hampton, who you mentioned earlier, you know, just murdered by the FBI. So we know why Fred Hampton's organizing didn't succeed, which is because he was killed by the state. So the decline is a tragedy. Some things can be averted through the choices of of movements and, and sometimes movements just get suppressed. I want to just conclude here by asking, I think it's become clear over the course of our conversation, but Maybe there's anything you you want to add to the question of why should people today read about, why should they study and understand the work of the young lords in the 60s and 70s? Well, if you're interested in transforming society, you need to understand it. And it's important to walk into the struggles of this period with knowledge of the struggles that came before you and their successes and failures. Unfortunately, history, as you well know, and its study is under attack across the United States. But there is a rich tradition of struggle in the working class, in unions, in communities, and many of the issues that young people and a new generation of organizers are mounting today were issues that folks fought for just four decades ago or even a decade ago. These histories, first of all, inspire, they educate, they offer political theory and analysis of the problem, because ultimately what we want to do is to win. And we need to equip ourselves with all of the tools we can get our hands on to mount a struggle against injustice for the purposes of winning. Strategy, 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 strategy is important. Uh, Coalition building beyond your very narrow issue is important. Connecting your narrow issue to the broader problems of society, figuring out how is it that this issue is connected to structural inequality. There are so many reasons. I mean, reading history independently of struggle and whatever you might be doing today in terms of organizing is a profoundly satisfying endeavor. It helps you situate yourself in the country's trajectory. It helps answer the question, at least for these young people and other people of color and their descendants, who am I? The quintessential existential question, who am I? And what's my relationship to this nation? And what can I do to expand the definition of democracy and freedom as others have in the past. I'll say this that has not been discussed, and that's that the Young Lords were Puerto Rican activists, all working class, who connected the crises in urban centers like police brutality, deteriorating schools, joblessness, deindustrialization begins and hits communities of color first in urban centers before it disfigures working class white communities across the country. So the Young Lords connected these problems of permanent joblessness, poverty of the schools, the poverty of the hospitals, uh, racism to the United States quiet imperial project on the island of Puerto Rico. So they believed in Puerto Rican independence. 
And they believed that these struggles were connected. So it's a rich history that is being written every day of the 60s. But the tradition of struggle in this country, I happen to be reading different elements of it. For example, in the early 20th century, Italian workers who began to organize cigar makers in Florida were lynched in the South for their organizing efforts in combination with Black Americans. Because when all oppressed working class people come together to fight for a different world and assert their rights as working people, we have a better chance of winning. That's why Fred Hampton was so dangerous, because he identified this coalition. He said, we need to come together on the basis of shared class interests. And yes, we need to fight against racism and understand the role of racism in society and its roots. But ultimately, we are all suffering. And the question is, how can we come together to continue to expand the meaning of freedom in this country for all? And I think what's so valuable about your book is that it is not just the young lords a history, but it is the young lords a radical history, which is that it is grounded in you know, studying the young lords for the purposes of understanding lessons of making the story relevant, of giving us things that we can use today to move the project that they were embarked on forward. So, Professor Johanna Fernandez, author of The Young Lords, A Radical History, available from UNC Press. Thank you so much for joining us on Current Affairs today. Thank you so very much, Nathan, for engaging me in this discussion. The Current Affairs Podcast is a product of Current Affairs Magazine. If you are not subscribed to Current Affairs Magazine, visit currentaffairs.org slash subscribe today and get our glorious print edition. The Current Affairs Podcast is released regularly every week on patreon.com slash currentaffairs. Thanks for listening.